panel. So we have uh, two speakers. We have uh, Ria, who is a lecturer uh, in molecular biosciences at University of Glasgow. And we have John, who is a researcher at John Innes Center. And they are going to talk about applying mathematical modeling to biological problems in plant sciences. So over to you, Ria. Thank you very much, Ajay. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. So yes, so we will be talking today about applying mathematical modeling to biological problems in plant science. And so we'll start with what is mathematical modeling? So very uh, generally, uh, it's ma a mathematical description of a real world system. So more specifically for biology, we can say it's basically using mathematics to help understand uh, the biology in some way. And that uh, involves using mathematical concepts and language, for example, equations to describe this biological process. And so the next question is why do we want to do mathematical modeling? So there are some cases where it's quite easy to get some intuition by knowing how different uh, genes regulate each other and so on. But then there are cases such as this example here, which is uh, a diagram of uh, the circadian clock from plants, where I don't know about you, but for sure I couldn't intuitively tell you what would be the mechanism to get the, the correct behavior for the plant circadian clock, which is basically has an oscillating behavior uh, repeating every day. And this kind of uh, feedback network can produce this behavior. But of course, it's not immediately intuitively uh, obvious. And so with modeling, what we can do is turn this into equations and run it on the computer and therefore test possible mechanisms and see which ones will give the right kind of response, for example. So more generally, the role of mathematical modeling, the kind of things that you can do with it, um, first of all, it's useful to propose hypotheses. So if uh, you start to develop the model, um, you can have some idea of how something is working. And so propose a hypothesis and then also use the mo model to test it um, and also predict behavior in new conditions. And so each of these things happens at a different stage in the modeling process. So as I said, when you propose hypothesis, this will usually be in the model development stage where you start to try to make a mathematical description and you find a gap in your system. And so you propose a possible hypothesis for how it could work. And then you go on to analyze your model and validate it with experimental data. And that can allow you to test this hypothesis. And finally, once you've gone through that and you validated your model, you can then use it to make the predictions. And this actually is uh, not a linear process as I presented it. It's more uh, what's known of cycles of modeling and experiments is uh, the common way that this process is done. So you start off with your model development and then you simulate your model and you collect experimental data and you compare the two. And what usually happens at this point is you find that there's something that's missing in your model. You find that you can't describe um, the process. So then you use that, you go back and you improve your model. And this is a, a useful point to learn something about the process by finding what's missing. And then after you've done a few cycles of this, you can get to a point where your model is validated and then you can use it to make predictions for unknown conditions. Um, okay, so after this uh, brief introduction, I want to start to tell you a few examples of mathematical uh, models in plants. And so I will start with uh, this model, which is at the molecular scale. So it's describing processes that are happening in the molecules inside the cells. And specifically uh, is an example from epigenetics and it's to do with modeling uh, histone modifications. So um, this is what's being shown here. So this is a histone with the DNA wrapped around it. So this is a way that the DNA is packed in the cell. And actually the histone proteins can have post-translation modifications that will affect the expression of the genes. And so you can have um, a modification that will cause uh, silencing, so the gene will not be expressed, or active histone modifications, which will make the expression, um, which will enhance the expression of the gene. And so what we can do is we can make uh, a mathematical model uh, of the behavior of the single uh, nucleosomes to describe the whole gene and how that is being expressed. 
And so we can simulate the state of these histones in the gene to describe the expression state. So, I mean, this is a, a real example. It's not actually from my work, but I, I will tell you uh, how it works because it relates to also the next example, which will be from my own research. So, so first of all, in this model, we have a discrete state. So we have the histones can take discrete um, states effectively. So they can be unmodified or have a silencing modification or have uh, an active uh, modification. And then there's stochastic transitions between them. So basically that means that we can have uh, the unmodified uh, state can randomly uh, be modified with a silencing uh, histone mark and that can come then unmodified and it can also go to the active histone state. And this is stochastic, which means these transitions have some probability and so they happen um, in a way at random. And so we also have discrete space because we're simulating the histones along a gene, and these are at discrete positions in our model. Um, and so, um, and what's known from the biology also is that there's actually feedback between these chromatin marks. So I said that the transitions are random, but actually uh, there is the probability of becoming modified with one modification depends on what other modifications are around you. And so this, this is what we say by feedback. So this probability will be higher if the neighboring uh, histones have this modification already. And so we can have here in our simulated gene, think, uh, mod histones being randomly modified. And then at some point, we're starting to get a lot of the active ones and that starts to push the silencing histone marks out and effectively we will end up with a fully, um, a fully uh, sorry, the fully active gene in this case. There. And so basically what that means is that this model predicts by stability. So you will either end up in a state where your whole gene has active modifications or the whole gene is, has silencing modifications. And so if you look then at what's happening in the cell, you will end up with a cell that is on, so it has the gene in this form, so it will be actively producing um, the, the product of this gene, or it will be off. And so this has been predicted for a few different systems, but we will describe it uh, for a gene that's involved in plant process, uh, which is called vernalization. So I will go a bit now to tell you about the biology of the system, what is vernalization, and then come back to how it relates to this model. So uh, vernalization is a process by which plants know, uh, monitor the seasons. So plants want to time their flowering so that they flower in spring uh, to avoid the harsh conditions of winter. And one signal that they use for this is the photo period. And so for winter, um, the days are, are short, the nights are long, so it's quite uh, obvious that um, it should not flower then. But in order to know not to flower in the autumn, a second signal is needed and that is cold. So the plant that um, I'm describing is Arabidopsis, the model plant. And so in that case, it's not flowering in autumn. And then once it's had a long period of cold, it is then able to flower um, in spring. And so this process involved a gene called flowering locus C, and this gene is a repressor of flowering, um, and then that is repressed by the cold. And this is also uh, a process that's epigenetic. So basically what that means is it has memory. And so you can see this is the RNA um, of uh, FLC over time. So it starts off high, it's repressed by the cold, but then it's epigenetically remembered so that even though the cold signal is gone, the low levels are remembered. And it's known that this gene is actually, its histones are modified uh, and it's covered in silencing histone marks. And so that basically suggests that um, we would expect to have this uh, bistable behavior where the whole gene can either be on or off. And so indeed it was tested experimentally and you can see that there are some cells that are off and some are on. So this, uh, by stability that was predicted by the model, does actually fit what's going on in 
the plant system. And this is uh, a microscopy image from the root tip of a plant that's had an intermediate uh, period of cold. And so it has both on and off cells. So we can use now this knowledge to make a different kind of mathematical model. So as I said before, we were talking about the, well, the, the individual histones. And so it was at the molecular level, but now we can try to look at what's happening at the whole plant. And so we can simulate um, the cells rather than the, the histones of a gene, because we know that all of the histones in a gene will soon become all of the same type. And so we have uh, now either a, a state where the whole cell is on in terms of FLC or it's off. And so we can describe this now with a continuous variable, which will be the fraction of cells in each of these states. So we can do a different kind of modeling actually. And because we'll be comparing it with data where we mash up the whole plant, so all the cells are mixed up, so we don't need to care about the spatial component uh, because we're just getting a concentration from the whole plant. And so, um, because we also have a lot of cells, actually, we can also describe this as a deterministic system, ignoring the stochastic uh, random effects. And so this is the, the mathematical representation then uh, of our model. So, well, sorry, it's the, well, it's not the mathematical representation that will be the equation, but this is the diagram that we will turn into the equations. So we give names to each of the states and it's easy to give just a single letter um, name. So this is H for a high transcription and each of them has uh, a letter. And then we also have the, the rates for the transitions between each of these states. And so we can use this to write ordinary differential equations, which is where we don't care about space it's a deterministic system and we have continuous variables. So all these are a uh, great thing to use for that. And so I will show you the OD for the first one and explain what it means. So the left side uh, to the equal sign is means it's the rate of change of H. So that is what uh, this symbol means that it's dH by dt and it means how H is changing with time. Um, and so H is the fraction of cells that are in this state. And so when a cell turns from this state into that state, this H will decrease, right? And so this is what this uh, negative sign means here. And then how much it decreases by will depend on the, the rate of this transition and on how much H was there. Because if you have more H, then this rate will be faster. And then you can also turn I cells into H cells. And so you can increase this H and that's what this means here. So depending on how much I you have, you can have this transition at uh, a rate, depends on the rate constant and the amount of I. And there's also uh, a third term, which is the H cells that are lost directly into the E state, basically. So, so this is what this uh, OD equation means. And we can, right similarly for the other uh, two variables, the other two cell states. And then once we have these equations, we can uh, write them into the computer using MATLAB or Python or R um, or other languages um, and then simulate it. So use numerical methods to simulate the behavior over time. And when we do that, uh, because the, the data that we can compare against is actually the measurements of FLC transcription, but only this H state is producing FLC. And so we can compare the levels of this H state against our FLC uh, results. And so we actually uh, did this uh, in a model that I was working on. And so we compared against a lot of experimental data, went through a lot of cycles to get the model right. And then we went and did uh, an experiment in field conditions. So this is the experimental data for FMC measurements in a natural uh, field condition. And this is taking measurements over a long time. And so this is data that the model had not seen before, let's say during the model development. So it was used to validate the model. And so um, it was actually th these transitions, I should say, depend on temperature. 
And so we could take the experimentally measured temperature as input into the model and then predict FLC. And indeed, it does a, a re very good job actually of predicting FLC in these new temperature conditions. And so now we have a model that we have validated this new data. So we have some confidence that it can make predictions. And so this next thing that we did is um, to, uh, to look in new temperature conditions, how this model will behave. And so we used some simplified uh, climate warming scenarios where we just increase the temperature by three degrees or we stretch the temperature profile so that the, uh, the average temperature each day is the same, but the fluctuations increase to get basically more variable temperature without changing the average. And so um, we can predict again the FLC in these conditions. And we've, the prediction that the, the model makes is that there will be a delay to fertilization. So flowering will also be delayed in these um, warmer climates. Uh, but this was actually a prediction made for temperatures based in England. Um, and if we do that for Swedish uh, temperatures, that's actually not the case. We don't really see a very big difference. And so the model can make quite specific uh, predictions for different temperatures. And it would be interesting to, to do more experiments to test these, but it can tell us something specific and give us a warning that in different regions, we will get different responses. And um, now I wanted to tell you about a different kind of modeling, um, which was on another component of the system, which was NTL-8. And NTL-8 is um, a regulator of uh, VIN3 and FLC, so it's part of this pathway, and it's instead induced by cold. So whereas we said that FLC gradually decreases um, over time in the cold, both VIN3 and NTL-8 increase gradually. And if we look uh, at what each cell is doing, it's actually quite different to what FLC was doing. So here we see a gradual increase in these cells here, and then this is spreading out. So it's not that some cells are on and some are off. The, the intensity is changing in the cells. So we have a gradual increase and a spreading out. Um, so what we also found out uh, was that NTL8 is a very stable protein. And so when you have a very stable protein, it's not degrading a lot. Uh, but what's happening is it gets diluted out um, by growth. So as the plant is growing, it's you're still decreasing your concentration because it's uh, being diluted. And so a, a very simple way to illustrate this is if you have uh, one cell with four molecules in, and then you now have two mole uh, sorry two cells um, and still four molecules, the concentration is now halved. Right. So um, of course. When you think about plants and growth, uh, the plant is growing much uh, slower in the cold than in the warm. So then we made a mathematical model where we wanted to describe the whole plant NTL8 concentration. And um, so we have the amount of NTL8 against um, the volume of the plant, which is the definition of the concentration. And so the amount depends on the production rate uh, and the time. And the growth, um, the growth rate and time gives us the, the volume. And so we proposed a hypothesis with our model, which was that this is the, the rate of change of the amount of NTL8. So basically the production rate of NTL8, we said does not depend on temperature. It's constant regardless of the temperature. And the thing that's actually changing is the growth rate depending on the temperature. So with this hypothesis, we wanted to test, is it possible to get this gradual increase uh, that we were seeing experimentally for NTL8? And you can see this is uh, the experiment and here's the model. So we do actually see that we can get this kind of gradual increase just by changing the growth rate. So the model does say that this is, seems like a possible mechanism for how you could be getting this kind of change. We then wanted uh, to test if we can capture the, the pattern that I described in the root, where uh, in the warm conditions, we have very low uh, amounts in just a few cells. And then as the cold progresses, we have more intense signal over a larger area. And so we made a mathematical model 
um, in this case, it's a simulation of a root. So we're simulating the individual cells in the root and the root is growing. And you can see that here. And you can also see here, there's a zoom of the root tip so that we can compare against the experiment. And what we did in our model is we basically have all cells dividing simultaneously. So in the root tip, you'll see the cells pushing the cells above them up. So there's things seem to be moving upwards. Um, and then the production is constant and also only in these cells over here. So this, oh, sorry, you can't see my mouse. Let me uh, make the laser pointer. Yes, yeah, so it's only in these cells over here. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so we have constant production only in that region. They're both in the warm and cold. So we want to see how the pattern would progress. And so you will have uh, the data next to it to compare. Oh, so you can see the root was growing fast in the warm and it slowed down in the cold. And what's happening is that um, during the cold, um, now it's taking longer between divisions. And so with the same production rate, we're starting to get uh, higher amounts in these cells here. And if we go, Later in the cold, now we're starting to have divisions, and so this is spreading out, but we're still getting a more intense signal in the cells at the tip. And when we go back into the warm, we actually go back to the pattern that we had before, where it's only um, at the root tip. But there's also this region here that's predicted by the model, which still has high signal, which is where uh, the cells that were dividing during the cold um, are that's where the, this growth was happening. And so at that time, they had more NTL8 and because it's stable, it's still staying there. So this was another prediction uh, made by the model. And indeed, when we looked experimentally, we could see this kind of region. So this is really uh, quite nicely supporting um, this hypothesis that the model proposed. Uh, and so with that, I will actually pass on uh, to John Fossard, who will tell you about another example and also um, an overall um, discussion about modeling and its uses. So, John. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about my work uh, modeling my own states. I'm a theoretician by training. So if I make any mistakes, please forgive me. Um, but I'll just give you a quick summary of what uh, my interest is about. So it's a special pair of cell divisions that happens in certain germline cells. In many species, each individual has two copies of the genome, with each parent contributing one copy to its children. Each copy contains slightly different versions of the same genes, and these similar chromosomes are called homologous. Here, I'm just showing a single pair of homologous chromosomes within a cell, but note that most organisms, most organisms have many chromosomes. As in a normal cell division, uh, the cells first duplicate their genetic information. These two copies are kept together after uh, replication, and they're known as sister chromatids. But during meiosis, there's a special step in which the homologous sister chrom chromatids become more linear and pair up with each other. Crossovers form between homologous chromosomes, where the two different chromosomes are spliced together. There's, following that, there's two cell divisions. Generating, ga uh, generating gametes with only one copy of each chromosome. Forming at least one crossover for every pair of chromosomes is really important for this, because if you don't have a crossover, um, this tends to result in uh, uh, problems where the wrong number, well, the incorrect number of uh, copies of chromosomes are just dis distributed to the daughter cells. And this can lead to genetic conditions such as trisomy. So the model I'm going to describe is just going to co concentrate on the phase in the red box where the number and positions of crossovers are specified. During this phase, the chromosomes straighten up and become much more linear than their usual compact form. Breaks in the DNA molecule, known as double strand breaks form, here shown by stars. The homologous chromosomes then become more closely paired, and that's supposed to uh, that's thought to be aided by the double strand breaks. 
At various points along the chromosomes, the synaptin more complex forms, and this is held together by special proteins. This spreads out and then forms a complete synaptin more complex the whole way along the chromosomes, holding them together. Once the synaptin more complex, uh, complex is formed, the double strand breaks are then repaired using the DNA from the homologous chromosomes. And there's two different ways of repairing these breaks. Most double strand breaks are resolved as non crossovers, in which the two strands are basically just stuck back together. However, a small number of double strand breaks on each synaptin more complex are repaired as crossovers, splicing together the homologous chromosomes. Here's a very old diagram, but you can see that the splicing together happening. Uh, and you can also see another reason why meiosis is important in that these crossovers generate new combinations of genes and so more genetic diversity. Uh, one key feature about uh, crossovers is that when a crossover is found on a chromosome, you're less likely to find another crossover nearby on the same chromosome. And this phenomena is known as crossover interference. And it's been a very long-standing open biological question as to how this interference process happens. My collaborator, Chris Morgan, did some experiments using antibodies and super resolution microscopy, in which he looked at the spatial localization of one of the synaptin more complex proteins and the protein high tech. Uh, in the left hand image, the synaptin more complex protein is magenta and the high tan protein is in yellow. Uh, it's a bit hard to see what's going on with high tan there. So if you look in the right hand image, the channel there is just high tan. And from this, you can see that in some cells, there's a large number of spots of high tech. These potentially could be the double strand breaks, although we don't have any evidence to prove that. In other cells, there are fewer spots of high tech, and these are much brighter than in the cells with many spots. And the average number of these bright spots is close to the expected number of crossovers in each cell. And in other work, it's been these spots have been seen and they've been found to be localized with other proteins that are involved in crossover formation. So we think these are very likely to be the crossovers. These observations with the localization of the high tan protein changing from a large number of dim spots to a small number of bright spots motivated the model that I'm about to describe. So this model has got six key features. So firstly, the double strand breaks, so the stars here, are placed randomly along the synaptin more complex. High 10 protein is allowed to diffuse along the synaptin more complex. We then got these foci compartments that kind of like the double strand breaks, and they're able to absorb the high 10 locally from the synaptin more complex, so it can go into the stars, but it can also escape back out from the foci onto the synaptin more complex. And one key feature of our model is that we've chosen these rates such that uh, the foci with higher levels of high 10 lose high 10 more slowly. Also, um, because of the way we've structured the model, the total amount of high 10 in the system is conserved. And what this means is basically that the foci with more high 10 kind of outcompete those with less, they suck up all the high 10, and they end up with most of it at the end of um, end of the uh, simulation. So here's just a cartoon showing what's kind of happening. So you've got the high 10, which is the red dots, the foci, which are the stars. Uh, the foci suck up the high 10 from the synaptin more complex. And then those with more high 10 uh, kind of uh, absorb more and more and more, whereas those foci with less high 10 lose, lose their high 10. And eventually most of the high 10 that ends up in a small number of foci. And our model is going to be that those foci are the crossovers, whereas those foci with very little high 10 are going to be uh, repaired as non crossovers. So here's the model with equations, just thinking about one focus. So each focus, we've got a differential equation for the amount of high 10 at that focus. It's got terms for the uptake of high 10 from the synaptin more complex, shown in purple, and a term for its escape from the focus back onto the synaptin more complex. That's in kind of orange. We've also got an equation for the concentration of high 10 on the synaptin more complex. But unlike the equations that Rhea showed earlier, the, this is a partial differential equation, which means it relates how the concentration changes in time with how it varies in space. 
So having high-end diffuse along the synaptic nemo complex, which means which means it moves from places with higher concentration to those with lower. The animation here shows how this diffusive process tends to even out concentrations. That would be the case if there wasn't any uh, any exchange with a foci. Um, we also need to include in this equation terms for high turn moving between the focus and the synaptic nemo complex. So this is what the equations would look like if there was just one focus on each synaptic nemo complex, but in actual fact, there's usually more than one. So the equations end up being a bit more complicated, complicated but they basically just sum up the effects of all the individual focus uh, or the individual foci. So this system of equations is fairly complicated, and so in order to understand what they do, we simulate them. And here I've used the Julia, uh, Julia programming language in order to numerically simulate the behavior of the equations. So this video here is going to show the results of the simulation. The blue line shows the concentration of high 10 on the side up to Nemo complex, and the stars so show the amount of high 10 at each focus. The foci quickly absorb the high 10 from the side up to Nemo complex, but then coarsening occurs with those foci with more high 10 outcompeting those with less. If you kept the simulation going forever, basically all the high 10 would just end up in one of the foci. But this stage of meiosis is of finite duration. It's about 10 hours in our abdopsis. So in our simulations, the final steady state isn't always reached. So you can, depending on when you stop it, you can get one, two, three, or, or more crossovers on each sign out to need more complex. In order to generate some data to test this model, Chris used his super resolution microscopy images. He traced each chromosome using a Java plugin called Simple Neurite Tracer. I then used some Python scripts to extract the high 10 concentration on each chromosome. The Python scripts then detected the peaks in these, in these signals and I identified them as crossovers. So on each uh, synaptic nemo complex, I can count how many crossovers there were and where they are. Here we compare the results of the simulations with the experiments. The plot here shows the number of crossovers on each synaptic nemo complex. Uh, you can see on the left uh, the experimental data and the right and the simulation data, and they're in pretty good agreement. Uh, on average, like the uh, most common number of crossovers on each synaptic nemo complex is two, uh, and the distribution is very similar, and very few synaptic nemo complexes, both in the experiments and in the simulations, have no crossovers, and that's what we'd expect. We also looked at the positions of the crossovers along the synaptic nemo complexes and obtained similar results to the data. However, this uh, histogram isn't very uh, instructive, so I then subdivided the data according to the single crossovers, the double crossovers, and the triple crossovers, and you can see from this that in both the simulation and the experiment and, and the experiments, uh, single crossovers tend to be found near the center of chromosomes, whereas double and triple chromosomes have got a more complicated distribution, and they tend to be found more towards the end. So uh, more recently, uh, we've looked at a, a mutant, uh, which challenges our original model assumptions. So in wild type cells, um, we've got a synaptic nemo complex, and our model had high ten trapped along each, trapped on each chromosome, but able to move along uh, the synaptic nemo complex. However, in this, there's a plant mutant called Zip One, in which there is no synaptic nemo complex, or it's it's incomplete. Um, and in plants, unlike in other organisms, even when there isn't a synaptic nemo complex, you can still get crossovers happening. Um, but so we tried to make a model of this. Um, but in this, uh, rather than high 10 being trapped on each chromosome, we allowed high 10 to move through the nucleoplasm. So we developed a new model, losing one of the, some of the assumptions from the previous model, but keeping many of it the same components. Um, so now, rather than uh, high 10 being exchanged between the foci and the synaptic nemo complex, high 10 is, can now be exchanged between the foci and the nucleoplasmic pool. So this here shows the equations for each of the foci and the equations for the amount of high 10 in the pool. Uh, they're very similar in form to the previous uh, system, but now it's just a big system of ODUs. Uh, 
So we then wanted to look at whether this nucleoplasmic coarsening model can explain crossover numbers in these mutants. So looking at the data, the key thing that we looked at was the spacing between the crossovers on the same uh, uh, same chromosome in cases where there were more than one crossovers, crossover on a chromosome. So if we look here, we can see in the data that in the wild type, there's not very many very closely spaced crossovers. And this is caused by interference between the crossovers. However, when we look at the data from this mutant, we see that there are quite a lot of very closely spaced crossovers. So interference seems to have been lost. And when we simulated our new model, we got a very similar distribution for the spacing of crossovers along the chromosomes. And again, the, both the model and the uh, mutant don't have any interference along a chromosome. But we also found that the number of crossovers in each cell was still regulated. So this is data from another group showing the number of foci, so sorry, the, basically the number of crossovers in each cell. Uh, and we can see that uh, the red data, uh, data is from the experiment and the green data is what you would get if the crossovers were like completely randomly distributed. And whilst the difference is quite small, uh, the experimental data is less varied than you'd expect if everything was completely random. And our model also um, has the same behavior. So uh, we can see the blue data is from the simulation. And again, it's less varied than you'd expect if everything was completely random. So uh, we found that by modifying the assumptions in our model, we were able to capture the behavior in this mutant. So I'm going to briefly describe to you uh, like uh, ways in which models can be useful. So they can help you with mechanic, uh, mechanistic understanding. So firstly, they can help you propose hypotheses for mechanisms, such as whether growth can be used as a thermosensor. Secondly, they can be used to test whether a hypothetical mechanism is able to explain a process, like with the meiosis model I just described. Thirdly, once the model has been sufficiently refined and the parameters determined, they can be used to make predictions, like the effects of future climates on plant flowering. However, when you're using models in biology, it's really important to realize that they have quite a lot of limitations. So models are only as good as their assumptions. If these are broken, you really can't expect sensible behavior from the model. They also can only really tell you about the things you've chosen to include in the model. So if you haven't included some other protein in your model, the model won't be able to tell you anything about it. Another problem with models is that they often contain lots of parameters such as reaction rates. These can be difficult to measure, and they can mean that the predictions are very vague and uncertain. There's a famous quote from Box saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And one way of thinking about this is that basically all models are necessarily abstractions. If you really want to know precisely what a system's gonna do, probably the best thing to do is to just actually experiment on that system. Uh, but a model is useful because it doesn't include every single thing that's in that system. Um, it's an abstraction. But that also means that if you push things too far, if you try to change things too much, then the model will break down. And often that breakdown itself can be the most useful thing because they tell you what's missing in your simplified abstract uh, I, assumptions about the system. Models also can't tell you what the key players are. Um, you need experiments for that. But they can tell you how those key players should, uh, should behave. For instance, in my model of meiosis, whilst high 10 is definitely the best candidate for the thing that's moving around and causing interference between uh, the crossovers, it's quite possible that there might actually be another protein doing precisely the same thing as what I've described high 10 is doing. Um, I can't, you know, just from the model alone, I'm unable to say whether it's high 10 or whether it's another protein doing the same thing. But I do know how that protein should be behaving. So uh, all these results, uh, you know, all the stuff that we described has come out of interdisciplinary collaboration. And it's worth mentioning a few things, key things which help with collaboration. So one thing that I noticed as a mathematician is that experimental data is messy and specific. Biological systems are really complex, like this picture of a metabolic pathway. The literature can be contradictory and confusing, 
And it needs the domain specific expertise from a biologist to understand what the important things are that you should include in your model and what things you should leave out because you can't make a model that has absolutely everything in it. Another problem with interdisciplinary collaboration is that mathematical models are just by their nature very abstract and simplified, like this picture of a spherical cow. And as a model, you've got to be really clear about how what you're doing relates to the biological problem and how it, how it helps answer the questions that the biologists have. So the key to success in all these things is communication. If you're two people working together, uh, it really helps to talk as much as possible and try it for both parties to understand what's going on with the other person's work. Um, Another key thing about these interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaborations is that depending on where you are in understanding the biological problem, uh, there's different kinds of things that you can do. If you don't know very much about the mechanism, you don't know very much about the data, uh, theoreticians can come up with very theoretical mechanisms for what's going on, such as the very celebrated example of the Turing patterning model, which can explain patterns observed on the skins of animals. Uh, so there, it wasn't really known what was going on, and the model isn't very specific about what's happening. Uh, it took many years for actually examples of the Turing patterning to be identified, but it does provide a way of understanding what's going on. If you don't know what's going on with the mechanism, but you do have lots of data, then you're in the domain of statistical models and potentially artificial intelligence. So that isn't really the focus of today's seminar, but uh, often those kind of tools can be really useful to work out what's going on when you don't know what's happening, but you do have lots of data. If you, know, if you have a good guess to what the mechanism should be, but you don't have much data, then mechanistic models come into their own. For example, in the case of the meiosis model, we had a guess as what the mechanism could be, but we really needed the model to work out whether that guess was enough, whether that mechanism could really work, or whether there were problems with it. And Finally, if you know quite a lot about the mechanism and you've got, the lot of, got a lot of data, then models can be really useful uh, in order to predict, uh, in, well, models can have a lot of predictive power, such as the example of the model for vernalization under climate change. So this work uh, is a, well, the stuff in this talk uh, comes from uh, collaborations with lots of different people. Uh, mostly these are RIAS collaborations, uh, but uh, a lot of the people are shown here. And my work on meiosis is a collaboration with Chris Morgan, uh, Chris Morgan and Martin Howard. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I hope you have some good questions. I could also say, yeah, thank you to, to all the collaborators and to Amberly BI for, for having some the funders that supported this work as well. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ria and John, for today's presentation. And thanks, everyone, for joining in and sending lots of questions. So we have lots of questions uh, in the Q&A box. So I've actually sorted them out in, in terms of most upwards, so the questions that have been liked the most. Uh, but having said that, please don't worry if your question is uh, not being addressed today. We will share the questions with the speakers, and uh, we'll get back to you with uh, answers for as many questions as, as possible. Uh, so Ria, could I go with questions now? Uh, yes, please. All right. So uh, the most popular question at the moment is, were there any tries to model the plant model with hidden Markov model instead of differential equations? Uh, or would it be possible? So, uh, I mean, I'm not actually uh, an expert on uh, hidden Markov models, but I think th th there were no tries, um, at least in the work that I've done or that I've seen. But I guess maybe if you were trying to um, understand about, let's say, the, the histone modification states and you had the, the FLC measurements, maybe that would be an approach uh, to try to understand that. John, would you agree? Do you, do you know anything more about that? <laughs> Uh, I don't know that much about hidden Markov models, but yes, you could potentially yeah. use one of those um, yeah. in place of the ODE model. 
Yeah, so next question is in the FLC model, how is temperature integrated into the model? Does it only affect the S and R rates? Yeah, so so I didn't go into that just for time, but uh, yes, so it's, it's affecting uh, the S and R rates, but actually one of those rates was um, also affected by the VIN3 concentration. So um, I don't know if it's probably not worth uh, showing this again, but basically the temperature itself directly affects some of the transition rates and the concentration of VIN3 is affected by temperature and then it itself affects the, the rate of the transition because VIN3 is needed for the epigenetic silencing step. So it's needed to help uh, get the, the polycom proteins active and in the working on FLC. And so its concentration will affect that. So those are the ways that the temperature affects that. And then how temperature goes into VIN3 is actually a whole bigger, more complicated question about temperature sensing. It's got loads of little ways of going in there. Uh, so I won't, I won't explain that now. <laughs> Uh, so the next question is, does the model consider regular interactions between the NTL8, Win3, and FLC genes? Yes, so, so I, it's kind of related to the proof. So it includes Win3, but actually just because of the timing that NTL8 was discovered, uh, this model was already kind of made before before that. So it doesn't include NTL8, but it does include VIN3 and the temperature regulation of VIN3 and how its concentration affects um, FLC. So yes, but only half of it. Okay, great. Uh, and I think this question came up when you were presenting NTL8 in the route. Uh, so it asks the data set used for the parameter estimation and model construction of the model was designed specifically for it or did you extract information from different sources so uh yeah it would be perfect to have data specifically for a model but what usually happens is and also because of the time it takes for experiments to happen is there's already quite a lot uh, of experiments at the point where you start and so you have to find a way to integrate all of it and then you start these cycles and there you can propose new experiments that will be specific for data. So we actually, uh, for, for at least for the FLC part of the model, um, we had uh, measurements that were done by different people and so on. And so we also had to find ways to normalize between different conditions, different experiments to be able to combine them. So that is uh, an important issue. Uh, and then in the case of NTL8, again, there was already a lot of data there when, when the, the modeling started. So. Okay, uh, next question. In in model validation, did you only compare the one output variable to the experimental data, FLC, uh, mRNA, or were more variables compared? If the former, do you see any issues that may occur by doing that? Yes, yes. So so actually, no, again, I, I didn't have time to. So Win3 was another one that was compared. And we did, for a subset, uh, also have data for... Um, the the chromatin states so so that was not directly included in that model but we extended the model and then used that as well to get a better idea because indeed you could come up with uh, many different models that could explain if it was just based on the flc so we had flc measurements from many different conditions and also on top of that the other measurements the vin3 and in some cases also the the epigenetic states to sort of validate our model a bit more uh, robust, parameter is more robust. Right, thank you. Next question is about uh, the tools that you used. Uh, so you mentioned R, Python, and MATLAB earlier as software tools for mathematical modeling. Are there more specialized tools researchers use for this purpose? So um, there has experience with the uh, COPASI. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, John, I think you also mentioned Julia. I mean, do you know any? Do you want to... um, I've used capacity a little bit, and I think um, it can be really useful as a way of uh, simulating some of these ODE systems. Uh, I'm not aware of any other similar tools, although I suspect there will be more. Um, I think um, 
So I think for more complicated systems, uh, programming languages such as Python and MATLAB are preferred by modelers a little bit because they're able to do more complicated things. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, I use Julia for my simulations. And it, I think for systems of ordinary differential equations, Julia has some really good tools, uh, which you can use to uh, do some more complicated analyses with. However, if you're just starting out with modeling, then I do think Capazzi is a good tool uh, to start uh, developing some simple models with. And it is capable of doing more complicated things too. Yeah, I'm also not aware of any other. I think I've seen Capazzi, but yeah, mostly languages. Yes. Thank you. Next question is for John. Uh, what is the biological basis to consider foci with high high ten to lose it more slowly? So we're not really sure what's going on at the foci, but we strongly suspect that they're big blobs with lots of proteins in them. Uh, and it's likely that high ten is interacting with all those other proteins. So uh, you can imagine that the foci with uh, high levels of high 10 will in, uh, attract even more of those other proteins they're interacting with and form, you know, a bigger blob, whereas the uh, those blobs with less of the other proteins will have less of the other interacting uh, partners. So there'll be more stabilization of high, you know, there'll be more things keeping high 10 within the foci and the bigger ones. Um, but there is something that we really need to explore further. So actually finding what's going on, you know, understanding the details of what's going on at these high-term foci would be really, really useful to explore later. So next question is, could you explain the validation of the FLC model? If I get it right, you mentioned that the validation was based on mRNA expression. Do you think there is a bias between mRNA expression of the gene and actual folded protein? So, yeah, so this model is very much describing gene expression rather than the protein. So it's possible that um, there, there can be regulation also at the protein level. I mean, that's a general issue with models that describe transcription. Um, for FLC, because we also have the, the GFP plan, which is that microscopy image, we believe it uh, works quite similarly. We also have imaging where we look um, at the transcripts with a single molecule fish. So, so it does seem to behave similar. Um, so that is in terms of this expression versus protein comparison, which is a, a general problem, as I say. Um, in terms of the validation process itself, I mean, the idea of the validation was hit the model with a complicated temperature profile that it's never seen before. How will it behave? So we had, you know, new experimental conditions. Can it make a prediction? And indeed, it doesn't tell us if it can make a prediction for um, the chromatin states, but it tells us it can make a prediction for the FLC expression. So again, as I say, for for the protein, maybe not. But um, so it's it's not a proof, but it does suggest that our model can be useful to make further predictions in similar scenarios, such as the, the climate warming ones that we tested. Okay. Thank you. So we're nearly uh, getting to one hour, but we can take a couple of uh, more questions. Uh, were the developed models solely data-driven or was there any integration of knowledge-based information? If so, can you briefly mention how that was processed? Um, I, I think that's, I guess, for both of us, but maybe I can start. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so so these, these were not uh, data-driven. Well, it depends what you mean by data-driven. So it was mechanism derived from data-driven initially. So, so for the FLC model, there's been research for many years uh, on FLC. So it was kind of all the understanding that was there about how the mechanism was working was used to create this hypothetical, you know, H, I, E states and the transitions between them. Um, and then that, that was how we integrated this knowledge. It was first make this biological model, which is this diagram, and then turn it into equations, see where 
things don't really match and then make, make adjustments. Um, hopefully that explains the process kind of. John? Do you... Yeah, and with our model, uh, it was definitely knowledge-based more than data-driven to start with. We had a potential hypothesis for what might be going on, and then we tried to make a model of that. Um, and then the data came in through restricting our parameters um, and as a test on whether the model worked. But we started off just with the idea that high tone was moving around and it was accumulating at these foci. Okay, so we didn't have much data to start with. Okay, so I would take just one more question. Vernalization is for winter plant. What about alternative plants like some varieties of wheat and summer plants like maize, rice, etc.? Yes, yeah, so so the, yeah, this is definitely for uh, winter plants. So, I mean, it's it's interesting. Also in Arabidopsis, there are the winter varieties and the non-winter varieties, and that really depends on if FLC is there to begin with. So, um, there's actually another gene called Frigida that's different between well what you might call winter and so if um if a plant is going to germinate in the autumn and then expect to go with, through winter before it flowers then it will have high FLC and then this model apply uh it will not be at all relevant for the summer plants because what they will do is they will genetically sort of have silenced FLC and so they don't need to go through this process. And then there's some that start with low and so on. So for the ones that have a little bit this process, we could make uh, some adjustments to the parameters maybe, but it will not be as important uh, a process. Now, because uh, you mentioned wheat specifically, for example, so there uh, it's not FLC, but there are other genes that have, that do this process of vernalization there. So, the model would also be different there, but I mean, making a, a model of analyzation for wheat is also a relevant. Great. Uh, so yeah, so thanks a lot, uh, Ria and Thank John you. for joining us Thank today. You. And uh, thanks to all the attendees.